start uh, our workshop, empowering dis displaced people and uh, migrants through online services. The initiative of uh, this workshop belongs to the, the representatives of academic community or the National Research University Higher School of Economics, Moscow, Russia. Uh, I want to introduce myself. I am Svetlana Maltseva. I am Dean of Business Informatics Department of the Higher School of Economics. And I'm glad to welcome all the participants and uh, all our remote participants. Uh, and uh, at first, uh, let me introduce the organizers of the workshop. Uh, it's uh, Dr. Mikhail Komarov, uh, Associate Professor of the Department of Innovations in Business of, in IT uh, of uh, Faculty of Business Informatics, <coughs> Higher School of Economics. And Mr. Ajay Ranjan Mishra, uh, who represents uh, ITU technical community. And also, uh, I'm glad uh, to introduce you our workshop panelists. Uh, it's uh, Dr. Andrei Shirbovich, uh, Faculty of Law, Higher School of Economics. Uh, Nasser Kitani, Microsoft's Technology Officers, Officer for Middle East and Africa. Uh, Anna Lucia Lenis, the head of policy for Google in Colombia, Ecuador and Peru. Uh, Yurio Lansipura, the president of Finnish chap chapter of Internet Society. Uh, uh, Nevin Tufik. Uh, uh, will not uh, be with us. And uh, Roxana Radu represents Kudit Institute of International and Development Studies. Uh, sorry, some changes in our panelists. Uh, um, Bazif uh, Mamadov, uh, who represents Ministry of ICT of Azerbaijan. And uh, uh, Yulia Marinets the founder and executive director of uh, uh, Together Against uh, Cybercrime International Organization. Uh, so uh, we can start. And uh, at first, uh, uh, at first uh, let me and the organizers uh, to do some short introduction to our workshop topics. Uh, please... Uh, show the, my, my presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I must say the uh, main goal of our workshop is uh, to understand the needs of uh, refugees and uh, displaced people and uh, migrants and uh, to discuss uh, uh, the uh, abilities of uh, internet technologies uh, to address uh, these needs. And uh, uh, first of all, uh, and first of all, um, I think uh, it's interesting to uh, see some statistics uh, that uh, indicate uh, the problems of uh, displaced people. Uh, uh, Unfortunately, I, I didn't see uh, this. Okay. Sorry. Uh, uh, you can see that uh, uh, you can see the permanent growth of uh, amount of uh, displaced people in the world. Uh, you can see also that uh, top destinations of uh, people who look uh, for living abroad is, uh, the, um, is the United States and the Russia. My native country now is in the second place. Uh, also, you see the list uh, of um, more attractive countries for uh, migrants and refugees. Uh, so maybe it's interesting to see that uh, uh, more than uh, half of uh, refugees comes from only five countries, Afghanistan, Somali, Iraq, Syria, and Sudan. 
uh, also it's interesting to see uh, that uh, in uh, Europe and Asia uh, we uh, can see almost the same uh, number of migrants. More than uh, 70% of migrants uh, are of working age, so for them it's critical uh, to find job uh, and uh, it's critical uh, services in employment and uh, skill recognition. Uh, from the point of view of um, host country and uh, from the point of view services uh, of uh, services, uh, maybe we can uh, identify uh, for main groups of uh, uh, displaced people. First of all, it's newly arriving refugees, uh, low-income immigrants, uh, resident uh, non-citizen, and the limited host language proficient individuals. For those groups, uh, services uh, must be different. Uh, what are the main uh, migration and refugee services groups? You can see this list and you see that employment, uh, skill recognition, uh, housing, health care, finance is uh, maybe in the top of this list. Uh, if uh, we... Uh, uh, we'll think how we can uh, help uh, in uh, organizing these services uh, using, uh, first of all, Internet technologies, information technologies, because uh, we're discussing this problem on the Internet Governance Forum. Uh, first of all, um, uh, maybe we can uh, uh, see on the uh, Trends uh, for customer services, and uh, those trends are used successfully in business, and uh, maybe uh, they uh, can be critical for uh, services for uh, uh, these uh, groups of uh, uh, people, for, uh, such as refugees and uh, migrants. And also it's a very interesting concept of... Uh, uh, citizen centricity. This concept is uh, uh, based on the result of um, consumer centricity, but um, you see that uh, uh, citizen centricity uh, uh, paradigm uh, based on uh, uh, very uh, big data about citizen. And for uh, migrants, for refugees, uh, the uh, centricity paradigm uh, uh, have many problems in their uh, realizing. First of all, it's absence of uh, or lack of personal information. Uh, also, the value for uh, migrants, for refugees, can uh, differ from the citizen value of the host population, and uh, maybe it's... Uh, uh, it will be useful and interesting to uh, build some models of uh, uh, refugees, models of displaced people. Uh, often it is hard to identify groups and group value. And uh, we have no information about previous and current experience uh, to predict uh, experience of uh, um, of uh, migrants and displaced people uh, uh, in uh, using services and also language problems. Uh, I must say that uh, uh, technologies and approaches now, uh, as I think and it is my opinion, uh, uh, have uh, the ability to solve many of uh, those problems. First of all, uh, I think uh, it's a very interesting idea of open data and the exchange of uh, different open data of between um, countries. Uh, of course, it's uh, idea of uh, concept of big data uh, and the uh, Internet of Services. Maybe uh, today we can discuss the uh, ability of those technologies too. Uh, so uh, I want uh, to finish my short presentation and uh, to um, uh, 
show you the question uh, that we, uh, I think, uh, can discuss uh, today. Because today there are a lot of uh, organization, government and non not government, that uh, um, can provide services for refugees and displaced people. But uh, we cannot uh, say that all problems are solved. Uh, I think uh, that services uh, must be uh, more personalized, uh, more relevant, uh, and uh, also they must be massive and uh, uh, automated, of course. And uh, uh, I want uh, to uh, 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 I want uh, to ask our panelists uh, to answer those questions: Which services should be provided uh, to the refugees and displaced people? Uh, who should pay for the, for the development and who is going to provide uh, services, companies, governments, public organizations, if uh, neighbor countries should develop services together uh, or some joint services in case of disaster at one of the country, and which is the role of new information technologies and new Internet models? Uh, so, uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, let's continue discussion, and uh, I want uh, to invite to discussion one of our organizers, uh, uh, one of our organizers, uh, Mr. Ajay Mishra, who will uh, do his presentation and uh, his report in remote mode, uh, and... Uh, who will uh, tell us about uh, problems of uh, migrants in India? Ajay? Yes, I'm here. Uh, can, can, can you... Uh, yeah. So can you start the presentation, please? Uh, sure. Uh, Mikhail, uh, are you able to show my presentation? Yes. 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 Okay, good. So we are on slide number one. Yes. Um, a very good evening uh, to everybody in Indonesia and a good day to everybody who is uh, remotely connected to the meeting. Uh, it is such a pleasure to see Dr. Professor Svetlana. Uh, it has been ages we have met, but it's always, uh, uh, you know, whenever we meet, it's, it's always a great discussion. <laughs> so here we are uh, in this uh, workshop. Uh, wherein I'll be uh, talking a bit about uh, the utilization of internet, wherein the refugees can utilize the tool to connect with both the home and the host country. Now, if we move to slide number two, we have seen this quite a lot in India, we do have an immigration uh, uh, refugee problem. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, in, in 1970-71, this became so big that it ended up in a war uh, with, with Pakistan and uh, led to the creation of Bangladesh. Uh, but having said that, I mean, if we leave aside the political issues, if we focus on people who are displaced for no fault of theirs, what are the basic problems they face? Any person who is, who is an immigrant, a refugee in, a, uh, in, 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 in a another country, the biggest problem is that he does not know who he can talk to. He, would like, he or she would like to be closer to people who know them. Generally in these refugee camps, we see a uh, lot of people have health problems for obvious reasons. Now, how to understand the local language, the local dialect, especially in a, pro in a country like India where we have 19 national languages, not one or two, 19. Then, the government announces the aid, and as in the case of the third world countries, generally the aid that is announced, you know, the, the complete, 
you know, there are a lot of middlemen and so on in, in, in countries like uh, uh, in, in the third world countries and the real aid never reaches. People do not know how much the government has announced uh, as their, uh, you know, packages for them. You know, government sometimes gives money, houses, uh, but, but they are not aware about that. And I see another big problem and that's education. <coughs> Most of the students who are displaced, who, who come as refugees or people or women, they are doing some education and somehow it gets disrupted because of uh, reasons that's not under their control. So I see these four things as, as one of the key in wherein the internet can really help. And when I say internet, I am talking about internet in general. I am not talking about, uh, you know, specific uh, websites dedicated to the refugees because generally it takes time uh, for these kinds of things to come up. But, you know, our, our own Google has, uh, you know, you, you type things and you, you, you really get news from there. If we go to slide number three, through the internet, Messengers, for example, people can really get connected to the near, near and dear ones. They can actually get to know what is happening to their uh, properties back home. Is somebody taking care of them or it's looted or it's uh, uh, hijacked by the local authorities or what, what is happening with that? They can, of course, get knowledge of the local medicines. Not only that, they can actually, you know, get to understand the terminology that's being used in the local country or in, in, the, in the host country. They can actually uh, get in touch with the, if, if, if some of the people are educated, they can get in touch with the, uh, the, the doctors of, of remote, uh, relocated, good hospitals. That, hey, we are facing this problem, what we should do? Because generally what happens is that when, when uh, exodus of refugees take place, people are, uh, uh, the, the, the amount of facilities that, that a government intends to give and the amount of facilities that come to the people, there's a huge gap between it. So, that can be uh, understood from there. Then, the local laws. Uh, people might not know that certain facilities are free for everybody. For example, the hospitals might be free. Now, when these things happen, people are not aware of the law. They might actually end up in pay in the government hospitals. While it might be free or let's say uh, it might be a dollar per person, you just have to register yourself and that's it and you can get the treatments for free. So there, there are, you know, a lot of people who are standing outside the hospitals and so on and telling these people, hey, you know, we can get your work done for free. We can get you a license. We can get you a ration card done. And uh, these are generally fake. And people are able to uh, purchase them, get licenses, which at the end of the day, at some point of time, they might be caught and put in jail because of having a, a fake identity. And last but not the least, people can actually continue education online, especially women and children for whom the schooling is really important or education is really important. So, in today's world, online education is there. Even if somebody is uh, uh, displaced from their home country to the host country, there are lots of courses they can do. They can get some education, get some jobs, because uh, sometimes... In, in countries as big as India, it might be very difficult for people to go back to their, uh, you know, home country. It's very difficult. We have a lot of people from Bangladesh who are staying in India. Uh, they have got their uh, ration cards, work permits done through XYZ means. But at the end of the day, you know, as a human being, I cannot really worry whether uh, a person is representing a nationality or why nationality. I think if he, he leads a good life, an honorable life, a respected, a safe life, he can always go back to the country. I mean, the, the, uh, the basic law, uh, if, if I go by the UN principles, is that people should be safe, should be secure, they should have the basic amenities at hand, and should not be 
tortured in in any form and I either from the government side or from the groups who are treated to loot such as that to really take advantages at, at such situations. If if I uh, if I if we can go to the last slide, uh, wherein uh, you know I, I, I give a, a quick summary. I think internet utilization is the best means to get connected to uh, either the home country or the host country without internet. People can really get educated about the laws, about the health system, the education. They can actually uh, get a life. In fact, uh, uh, Mick, uh, as Nelson Mandela once said, that let, let there be uh, food, water, and salt for all, I would like to, you know, I'm a very small person in front of a towering personality like Nelson Mandela from South Africa. Uh, I would record that sentence as, let there be food, water, salt, and internet for all, for a good life. Uh, with these words, I would uh, close and uh, open for questions, if there are any on the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Ajay. Um, <coughs> Ajay, thank you very much. Uh, maybe uh, some questions uh, from the floor or fro from our remote participants. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, of course, uh, we must uh, maybe uh, do some introduction to uh, uh, technological aspects of uh, the problem uh, uh, which we want to discuss uh, today. And uh, I want uh, to give the microphone to uh, Mikhail Komarov. Thank you very much. I will try to be... Uh, uh Quick, uh, as quick as possible. Um, from you know, from the technological perspective, anyway, I would like to uh, probably someone of your uh, saw that slide. But anyway, I would like to to emphasize that we are talking about uh, economical development, which is based on technological progress and technical progress. And here we can see some basic phases of of the progress uh, when we're talking about uh, mobile communications. Uh, when we're talking about communications itself. And uh, uh, I just would like to announce that uh, mobile technologies, uh, our cell phones, uh, they are the most common, uh, let's say, devices and uh, technologies used around the world in terms of uh, services provided uh, uh, within help of, of these devices. Uh, so when we are talking about uh, refugees and displaced people, uh, there are also uh, already uh, some services provided uh, via cell phones through SMS, uh, through short messages uh, services uh, and cell phones to connect families to check uh, quality and uh, to find uh, some medicines outside the countries, outside the home countries. Uh, to uh, inform people about emergencies and disasters. And uh, even a Deputy UN High Commissioner for Refugees already said that uh, we, should, uh, change, um, we should change our policy in terms, of, uh, uh, in terms of obligatory things which should be provided uh, to refugees and displaced people. Uh, we should also provide them uh, internet and we should also provide uh, them with some uh, basic services already like Skype, biometric databases, Google Earth, and so on. And uh, so where, that's where actually Internet of Services comes. Um, we just had discussion about Internet of Things, but uh, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about Internet of Things or Internet of Services. I just would like to emphasize that we are talking about data. We are talking about data, and uh, we are talking about data utilization, proper data utilization. And uh, that's why when we're talking about Internet of Services, we are talking about services data-driven, personalized, as it was uh, already announced. So customer, citizen centricity, uh, some displaced people, so people should be in the center, and we should provide services for people, definitely, right? And uh, now, uh, in terms of uh, massive uh, services, uh, we are talking about web-oriented services. Um, what I want to say, uh, we are talking about uh, Internet of Services as a mechanism which would help us to... Uh, 
empower people, uh, empower displaced people, uh, empower migrants uh, with, uh, uh, with the services they need uh, based on, uh, based on uh, some uh, applications, case by case. And uh, when we're talking about uh, services already introduced, I'm uh, not, you know, we, we have many devices around us. We have many services around us already introduced, not just informative services, but also services on the level of MTM communications, on the level of Internet of Things. And actually, these services, they also would be uh, quite useful for the refugees and for the, for the displaced people, but they're not just adopted for them. And actually, uh, manufacturers and service producers, service developers, they haven't... Uh, thought about, you know, these people when they were proposing services. Uh, in terms of uh, governmental involvement, uh, from my perspective, uh, we're talking about government as a policy maker for applications and services. Uh, in terms of probably crowd-based platforms, etc., we are talking about government as the developers of educational services, government as a... Uh, involved in, in, in uh, providing cultural and the traditional services, just, you know, informative services for the, for the displaced people. And also uh, some, some, some other, you know, basic, uh, let's say, governmental services. Uh, that's actually what, what I wanted to say. So uh, we have a technological side as a basis. We have different hardware platforms but we are not talking about just hardware platforms. We are talking about data, which, uh, which, is, uh, which is provided by these hardware and software platforms. And these data, these data-driven uh, services should be introduced to displaced people uh, to help them assimilate uh, in terms of some uh, informative services like law, you know, about law, and traditions, culture, uh, in terms of uh, some services for, for the seeking, you know, job seeking uh, for migrants and, 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 and so on. So just try to be, uh, you know, as quick as possible. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mikhail. Uh, so uh, our organizers and me, we have tried to uh, highlight the main uh, raw data for our discussion. And uh, um, now uh, we must uh, discuss the critical questions uh, and uh, uh, so uh, I think uh, we can start from the first uh, question, uh, which uh, services uh, should be provided to the refugees and displaced people. Uh, I think that um, uh, uh, I will ask uh, some of our panelists uh, to uh, uh, give us our, uh, their opinion. And uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Nasser Kitani and uh, Yuri Lansipuro and uh, Andrei Sherbovich. And then maybe questions from the floor and from our remote participant. Uh, please. Uh, so I think you covered a lot of those. Uh, I, I'd like to add a few things uh, to what you said in terms of the basic services that needs to be provided. I, I look at it from the, from the angle of, first of all, we need to have up and running infrastructure. I think we tend to forget that, but in many cases when we have refugees, we might not even have internet connection uh, up and running in those places. And, and in some cases, even if we have it, it might not be a, um, at the scale of supporting, you know, hundreds of thousands of people in a very small area um, because it was not designed that, that way. So, so the first thing is, the first, I would say the first thing is to have basic infrastructure up and running to support the needs of, of this population um, at the right time. And that's a very difficult problem to solve. Um, so that's number one. And number two is to have those basic services that we talked about, um, uh, services such as, you know, education, um, uh, communication, um, uh, you know, uh, health care, understanding their uh, rights and uh, and, respons and, and responsibilities and, you know, and obligations in the country, etc. These are, you know, sort of basic services. And I would argue that because we are in the world of innovation and technology, um, there might be another level of uh, additional 
uh, you know, services that can be provided by, you know, by uh, smart developers who, who are not in this room, but, but who might understand the needs of these people. And by come up with some crazy ideas and innovative ideas to support the needs of certain categories of those people. So, so I look to, to it from you know, these three things, you know, basic infrastructure, Second thing is basic services, communication, you know, being able to, uh, to locate their parents uh, and, and talk to them, uh, being able to understand their obligations and rights. And, and the third pillar is really about, you know, how do we do it in a way that enable innovation and bring, you know, different services for, for different people. Thank you. Thank you. Andri, please. About the services which uh, need to be provided. Uh, first, I'd li like to uh, access to the legal uh, protection, access to courts, uh, and uh, according to that, uh, this court accessibility uh, is uh, would be uh, the best practices for uh, services which uh, I see uh, very important to be provided. Uh, at first, uh, they uh, should be on the relevant uh, language for people who are foreigners and do not know, know in, uh, in, in, in not a good abilities of speaking in the language of the countries of, or, or the mig migration. So uh, they need uh, to access information, how to get the local attorney, how to uh, have access to the court uh, service, how to um, uh, access the refu uh, refugee attendant uh, migration services uh, on, on the language they could speak. That's the first point. The second point is uh, are the other uh, rela related services which I think uh, needed to be provided. Uh, they are uh, a, a kind of a, a, a library uh, we could, or, or the legal database or with, the, with, the, uh, with the major uh, uh, legal acts uh, they should uh, follow for example. Uh, uh, I, I could uh, see the example of the best practice from Indonesia. So uh, when, when, I, when, when I arrived in this country, I uh, filled the immigration form. I'm not a refugee, but it's, it's a kind of an example. There, there's a written in, 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 in red capitals that uh, the drug traffickers are uh, sent, uh, sent to the death penalty here. It's a, a good... Uh, uh, kind of information about the current uh, laws in, 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 in the country. <laughs> uh, so, uh, the, I, don't, I don't know about the refugees with the, with the, with the draft tra traffic, but <laughs> it's okay. So, that's my point of view. Please. Okay, you, you. Yeah, thank you. First of all, I have to confess that I, uh, this is a subject, an area which is uh, uh, not very familiar to me. But since I was asked by, by my friends whom I met in Paris in February to be here, so here I am. First of all, uh, I, I think that the, we, we are talking about very different groups and types of people. You're talking about migrants. And migrants, uh, you, know, you know, they can be actually people who are, are quite well-to-do and come to Finland to work for Nokia as engineers, as long as Nokia is there. <laughs> so, but then, uh, on the other hand, you have all sorts of migration, and the needs uh, we are talking here about are, are very different from each other. Then, of course... Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, we talk about refugees, we talk about displaced persons after some disaster or political crisis, maybe living in camps and so on and so forth. So uh, there are really very different needs for hierarchies of needs uh, for, for all, all these people. Um, uh, Finland happens to be a country which 
people used to emigrate from Finland and not so much take, uh, take uh, immigrants into Finland. But now, of course, we have immigrants. And the, the basic policy is to integrate them as, as, as fast as possible. That means that services and net services, web services, are mostly integrated within, I mean, whatever agencies there are that provide those services, they are, are they try to integrate them there. Uh, the language is, of course, a problem. I mean, Finnish is a very difficult language, and uh, so that, uh, and, and, and the people who come have different languages. But, but anyway, one of the applications is, is really to use the net uh, web applications for language training, because that is one of the first things to be able to function in a society. Uh, the, uh, yeah, it's true that you, you, you want to talk to your home country, but that's, I, I think that that's mostly actually these uh, telecenters, which are run by immigrants themselves, are, are really sprung up in, in various parts of the, of the city, at least in Helsinki, especially in those parts where the immigrants are living. So that actually, that actually provides business opportunities for uh, immigrants who are savvy technology. Um, then at the other end of the scale, I mean, we're talking about people living in camps and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm really, I don't know much about that, but I, 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 I saw that among the links provided in this, this book, the references, there was a story. I, I followed that link and found, uh, found uh, an organization called Refugees United. And that, what they are doing is, is a very good example of, of how, how the, this technology can be used in an innovative way. That is to say, it, it, that's a tracing, family tracing service, because one of the problems is if you are camps or displaced somewhere, you lose touch with your relatives, sometimes with your, your children. And apparently this service has been, it, it can actually, it can be accessed even by cell phones now. And it, ha, it has been of great use for for, for uh, that, that, sort of, that sort of purposes. Um, there's one thing, if we have time, I could touch a, a subject that is related to this a little bit. It, it's, it's also about disasters, but it's a disaster in uh, which the people of your country happen to be victims of a disaster some, in a faraway place. I'm talking about the tsunami in Thailand, and, and we uh, developed some improvised solutions at that time, but perhaps that's another story, and I'll come back to that if, if we still have time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, to Julia. Uh, microphone for Julia. <laughs> thank you so much. Good afternoon. Um, first of all, thank you for this invitation. I'm very, I'm very glad to be here today, and specifically, we... Um, um, I'm from the organization Tech Together Against Cybercrime International, and we started two years ago, two years and a half, to work in the area of uh, vulnerable, what we call vulnerable people, but obviously vulnerable people could be migrants and refugees as well, as it defined by the Tunis Agenda for the Information Society. Uh, and um, so, so we, and how we arrived actually um, to this uh, to this question of vulnerable people in the information society, or how ICTs could assist or better integrate uh, vulnerable people, migrants or refugees in the um, in, in the in the society, in economic or social life. We mainly work in the area of cybercrime, cybersecurity, channel and uh, protection. But uh, being in the field, we just realized that a target group, which is the vulnerable group, they are practically, they don't have um, enough information, not because the information doesn't exist, but because uh, they can't access the information due to the linguistic problems or other problems concerning the how to be safe and responsible online. So practically what we realized is they are much, well, they are fragile online. They can be involved in illegal activities and become easily um, 
victims of cybercrime threats. So somehow we uh, arrived to, this, uh, to the conclusion that we do need to raise the question of how to protect or empower vulnerable people uh, in the information society and launched this discussion two years ago during the uh, IGF in, uh, in, in Kenya. Um, now, if we, I think the question was um, which services should be provided to the refugees and displaced people. So, um, or um, it was the question also about the rights. Which rights, which kind of rights do they have? I think we don't have like a simple answer to this, but if, if we want to summarize in two words, I would say, you know, the same human rights as, as every human. It is uh, included and in in, it's written in the Universal Convention on Human Rights. Um, first of all, I think the, it was underlined already a, a number of times, it is the access to, to Internet and the access to information, whatever it is, the information concerning how to be safe and responsible or not, online or how to, uh, um, to be integrated in the economic life of the new society. Um, but before I think, and I would like actually to share our experience, uh, particularly concerning migrants, um, and speak about the project we have developed uh, um, with the number of European partners uh, at the European level. Um, first of all, I think before, uh, before we speak about services we need to provide, we need also to communicate and to raise the awareness about the, this service's existence or potential existence of these services of the local authorities uh, who are in a direct contact with these people, with migrants, because they deal in the field with these people. So um, we need to empower them with the knowledge that, you know, the information society and the ICTs today can bring new opportunities for migrants. You can implement these solutions, the solutions in the field of economic integration, social, cultural integration, obviously how to be safe and responsible online, etc. Because the local authorities themselves, they are not aware about the existence of these solutions, the existence of the potential possibility to have these solutions. And so what we've done, actually we launched uh, to, uh, one year ago um, a project that we call the Sprint, which was the mainly we developed uh, with... Uh, with our, our um, other seven partners at the European level, it was a EU-funded project. Um, we developed an introductory course for local authorities, representatives on, uh, on how to use, uh, on the use of ICTs for better integration of migrants. So practically it's an uh, online available course which um, uh, has five chapters and the local authorities, representatives, uh, can follow online and they have an evaluation afterwards and the certificate is, uh, can be provided. So the main idea was to, you know, to raise the attention, to raise the awareness and to uh, bring to their attention the fact that we have solutions in different fields, all fields that what, uh, was discussed before, even uh, concerning in the medical uh, or health assistance area uh, with the use of ICTs. And once they know, local authorities know that the services can be provided, they can implement or help to implement these um, services and bring to the migrants because they are in a direct contact with them. So um, for the moment being, my two cents, I would be happy to, to discuss afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Yulia. Uh, so maybe some questions from our remote. Uh, yes. I get a question from Leonardo from Aberystwyth University. The question is, if governments are re reluctant to provide internet service to their citizens, then who do you suggest should form the strategy and who should they solve the barriers put, put in place by the repressive government? Uh. Uh, I think uh, it's uh, the next question, and uh, maybe I, I uh, can uh, ask to uh, answer this question, maybe Vasif Mamadov. Thank you, Chairman. So, uh, first of all, uh, on behalf of the Ministry of uh, Communication and Information Technology of Azerbaijan, I'd like to extend my uh, high gratitude for this important topic. The reason is, actually, my colleagues... They touch the issue of uh, legal background and also infrastructural background, but we miss one point, it's about experience. 
and traveling in the Bishbex experience. And Azerbaijan, as you may all know, we are having a problem with Nagorno-Karabakh, which actually was resulted with a mo almost one million refugees and IDPs. Therefore, we have, a, like, for the last 20 years, we have quite enough uh, experience and obtained quite best practices how to deal with the issues of refugees and IDPs. And starting with experience, I mean, uh, directly answering the question, I know that we have a limited time. Uh, the services, I think different countries, they de deal with different services. Like in Australia, they have the refugees' cash assistance. They just do it in cash, or they do have uh, medical assistance. But in Azerbaijan, we have a specific role, and we have a committee on that dealing the issues of refugees, State Committee of the Republic of Azerbaijan on deals of the refugees and uh, IDPs. And we have a law that was even uh, adopted in 1999, and then with some specific amendments. And this law actually provides this kind of specific services for the refugees, and they are uh, free education and uh, free health care, as well as uh, the food, uh, the groceries, that free for weekly base and also providing them with specific concessions. So the main point of this law is not just only make uh, normalize the life of refugees, but it's making it better than the normal citizens because they do have been moved from their uh, lo the life that they build on or the, the, the uh, career they have built on or in, in a specific uh, emergency that they went through. They, some of them they, uh, lost their family members and so forth. They just went through. So uh, in this case, particularly, uh, I guess uh, we're not going to have a time to go touch one by one. So if it's okay, I'll touch all of the questions and just briefly, simply. And uh, the things regarding who will fund it, well, in Azerbaijan, we are the major funding comes from the government. And daily basis average is $300 million. And what was before, and since 2008, it's 300 million monats, and it's almost the same as the euro. So these uh, funding goes all about uh, building the new uh, cities, mini cities for the refugees and IDPs, and providing them with every single system. And going back to the issue of ICT, and if you have a chance to look at the uh, website of the state committee, it's quite, quite uh, modern, and you can see that there's e-services of the government providing to for refugees. And really interesting fact that about that is some countries, they try to involve as much as, as possible civil society or private sector for the implementation of funding of uh, projects regarding refugees and IDPs. But in the end, as uh, already indicated in uh, the question, there's a need of strategy. And strategy, as my colleagues mentioned, that should be uh, backed with a, uh, with a legal background. And legal background should be backed by experience. And this is a kind of triangular relation among them. And uh, going back to the issue about uh, how the neighbor countries, like our participants mentioned about disasters and how they actually deal with, there's so many examples actually around the world. I may, I'm quite sure you, well, most of you know like the issue of Back to School initiative that was organized and conducted by, together with uh, Lebanese and uh, Palestinian states. That the aim was that for providing the, the refugees, for the Lebanese refugees from Syria, with uh, uh, major, like, main uh, school items in order for them to have at least a kind of infrastructure, so small infrastructure for them for having education. So from the perspective of Azerbaijan, we actually uh, think, you know, the, the point is that not only normalizing the lives of the refugees, but trying to make it better than uh, the normal citizens. And the, the point here is that to see, in order to have this balance, because there's the one thing that we can't ever and uh, reimburse, and that is actually the mental things that they went through, and there's no price for that. So, therefore, actually, when we're thinking about any, uh, preparing about any kind of law regarding refugees, we should take this point into account. Thank you. Thank you, Asif. Do we have uh, another question from the, our remote participants? Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. This from Sergei Sergei Efremov. Uh, using even the simple IT service require. Uh, sorry. <laughs> using even the simple IT service requires a certain certain level of information literacy. But migrants and refugees are often not educated enough to use the provide possibilities. Could you please suggest the possible ways of solving this problem? 
Андрей. I'll try to answer the question uh, because uh, uh, several period ago I was uh, employed with the UNESCO Information for All program, uh, which is active also with the Internet Governance Forum. Uh, they are raising the issue of inter uh, information literacy. So, uh, information literacy uh, is a global uh, part of uh, the issue of information culture uh, of users. And the, those uh, items are interconnected with each other. So it is possible to be information literal, uh, but uh, without having any information culture. Uh, this problem is also exists. But uh, when we are talking about, uh, for example, issues called the Arab Spring, uh, now after that uh, uh, we have a lo a lo a big flows of uh, refugees from, from the Middle East. Um, uh, those revolutions in uh, Arab countries was done uh, by using uh, the uh, Internet technologies. You know, when they could use Facebook and other uh, applications to make uh, those re political regime, I think they could use uh, Internet technologies for properly uh, for using applications which could save their lives, which could uh, save their lives and which could uh, uh, maybe accommodate them uh, to the whole society. Uh, that will be my answer. Thank you. Thank you, Andrei. Uh, I must uh, ask our panelists to uh, be uh, maybe shorter in their answers and uh, maybe three or five minutes for the answer. Uh, uh, have we remote questions? No? No? Any? I get this one. Okay. Uh, this problem. Fred, University Uni University. Uh, could online service play a greater role in the provision of food in crisis situation? Could you? Uh, uh, what was the role uh, played in the increasing uh, situation? Role in provision of food. In crisis situation. In, in, in crisis, in crisis situation. Uh. <laughs> Could online services play a greater role in the provision of food in crisis situations? Can I, can I have a microphone? Okay. So it's a question about online services uh, playing a greater role in the provision of food in crisis situations. So, like, you know, food services probably mm -hmm. through online? Uh, Julia? Thank you. Well, I, I think we don't have like a, a, a simple answer to this question. This is obvious. Just to bring a, uh, an example, for example, we I had a, an occasion to work with um, colleagues from. Um, uh, from Kenya, and I know in Kenya, for example, they use online services like emergency SMEs and other in, uh, in um, disaster management or in case of crisis. So, of course, this can be a solution because ICTs could uh, bring an answer or even the information closer to the uh, to the to the population. And um, in, in another example, actually, I just um, remembered. Uh, we worked with the um, OECD on a, on, a, on, a, on a project, and um, um, the, in Latin America, the professionals in the agriculture sector, they were receiving actually the SMS via mobile, uh, mobile phone, which was a, um, a mobile service, on um, which products are available, for, for example, for cereals or something like that. Well, you, better, yeah, you, know, you know maybe better about this case. So, of course, we, we can use it because it's always the question um, of the access to information, which can be easier. Thank you. Thank you, Yulia. And uh, I think we started to discuss a uh, second question. Uh, so I, I ask uh, to uh, uh, give us... Uh, maybe a short presentation 
Анна Люсия, Денис. Thank you. Uh, well, I think uh, uh, we can continue with that some examples that can help with that to understand how mobile technology and the internet could help with uh, this uh, kind of problems. So, for example, after the 2010 uh, earthquake in Haiti, um, a young research team from the Karolins, uh, I don't know if it's a good pronunciation, Karolinska Institute from Stockholm, that is a medical school, and the Columbia University worked uh, together in the development of a tool uh, that used the information of the ca a local carrier in Haiti. Uh, and they used this information uh, Uh, to pro, uh, about the how the people uh, was move, moving inside the country before and, and during and well, before uh, after the earthquake and the disaster, and they provide the information to the humanitarian agencies um, with updates on the population movements in this country. And this information was very useful for the authorities and then for these organizations to allocate resources more efficiently. So for, uh, I think that sometimes when uh, we have the, a natural disaster, for example, the lack of information and where the people is moving uh, inside the country or the, in our region makes them a most vulnerable group because uh, the relief organizations, they, they don't know exactly uh, where the people is uh, localized uh, and, and how to deliver the right amounts of supplies for the right places. So this is a huge concern for this kind of organizations. So in this case, the, 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 the universities are use the infor, uh, information available in the uh, mobile networks to provide this kind of information to these organizations. And another quick example is that, uh, that we call the, this project crisis response is, for example, when uh, we, have, um, uh, we have a disaster, uh, earthquake or another kind of disaster, and, for example, a massive flow that happens in uh, India in July this year, and thousands of people were displaced from their, their own homes. And with that technology, we can use a, or we can create a crisis map with road information and the localization of the relief camps, medical centers, food supply for the people that was trying to, ca to find information about uh, some help. So, and for example, we can use the technology to find people during the disasters. Uh, so we can use uh, uh, tools like the Person Finder that is a web application that allows individuals to post and search for the status of relatives and friends, uh, and friends affected by a disaster. So this is uh, only two, uh, two examples of that, how we can use the information of the, on the uh, platforms Uh, to provide good services for uh, refugees or for displaced people or for migrants. Uh, I think that we have the, the, the tools and, and, the innovate and, 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 the, and the challenge is how we are going to innovate and create new, uh, new tools that will be helpful for everybody. And I think that I, I want to highlight only two, two ideas. We need open platforms. And we need open data to create this kind of tools. Because if we, have, if we don't have access to the information, it's going to be very difficult to innovate and to create new alternatives, new tools for the uh, displaced people or for migrants. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I want uh, to ask Nasser Kitani maybe say some words on this problem. Yeah, on, on, on the question of, I think the question is who pays, right, and who's funding. Um, I, I, I think it's, the way I, I look at it is it's a combination of, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of a public partner, private public partnership. Government has a role to play. Private sector have a role to play. I think uh, NGOs have a role to play. 
and and I would argue that even you know, uh, and and uh, as we mentioned, and we probably will go to that later on, is uh, is the, the discussion about you know the new innovators who can come you know like uh, others who can come and build new uh, new stuff based on on the existing infrastructure. So governments have a role to play because they they own a lot of data. They uh, uh, obviously they own the infrastructure uh, on which uh, all these things work, and they have to, to to deploy it and so forth. So they have a role to play. I think the private sector has a role to play. We have seen in many of these crises uh, that were mentioned, you know, uh, organizations such as you know Google, Microsoft, and, and, you know, and others have jumped on, built applications, put them in, in there, and and will continue to do so. And and there are many um, participating in this. I think NGOs have a role to play as well uh, in, in that because they, they, they understand the issues. They are core to the issues. People that are in, um, in, in health uh, in, um, uh, or in food or in you know, the human rights, et cetera, they understand those things better than anybody else. And, and they might even have funding mechanism to support. So it's a combination of these things. But the, the fundamental issue which, which was just mentioned is um, if we don't have open data that is provided by, by you know, governments, uh, by private, even some private sector that is out there, we cannot be innovative and create things you know, in, the, in the situation of emergency because these are things that are not developed before urgency. In many cases, they are developed well while there's air efficiency. So we have like 24 hours to react. And this is what we're talking about. So it's about building applications and innovations in the matter of 24 hours, 48 hours to react very quickly to, to address that very specific problem that, is, that we're facing. And in this case, it, you know, Cooperation is important, so it's not like somebody who will fix it. It's, a, it's, it's how do we actually work together between, you know, private sector, public sector, uh, government, and, and, you know, NGOs, universities, et cetera, as a group to actually address the problem. And two, how do we make those data, the people who have data have to put it on the table so we can go fast and, and innovate. This is absolutely very fundamental um, into, into the process. So funding is a multi-stakeholder, but also collaboration is absolutely key. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, maybe uh, you want some words? Well, I just, uh, just brought a tiny remark, because I made an already touched this point in, in my previous speech, but uh, the question of the remote moderator, uh, and I know Lucia and Julia already mentioned the uh, response, but I want to just add a quick example, and it's a really good example, that because today is the 23rd of October, I don't, I'm wondering whether it's a negative or a positive coincidence, but like two years ago, there was one earthquake in Turkey, which took like more than 300 uh, lives in one night. And what, why I'm mentioning this specific example is that uh, the online campaign that they commence, just within a week, they are collecting more than like the uh, amount of the money that government made one month later as a support to the one. So this is one of the good examples how actually processing online and uh, helping in disaster relief, the use of the ICT, and how the social network can be sometimes even far more powerful than the government. Thank you. Thank you, Vasif. And uh, we will move to the third question. Uh, if uh, neighbor countries uh, should develop services together, or some joint services in case of disaster at one of the country. And first of all, I want uh, to pass this question to Roxana Radu and uh, Andrei Sherbovich. Roxana, please. And uh, I ask you to use maybe a three or three minutes for... Yeah, I'm just going to make um, two points. So on this question, I think uh, it really depends on the political co context, and it would be great to have cross-country cooperation. Um, I'm afraid it's not possible in all of the cases, and if the people are displaced because of uh, war conditions, that's actually impossible, as we know. The development of joint services could be done, however, in, on platforms that um, would be available for sharing codes and uh, could be even implemented outside of uh, 
um, of conditions of um, political tensions, if we use, for example, open source code or if we try to integrate uh, the communities that are working you know, in an apolitical way, but as such, on a political level, I think it's going to be very difficult to achieve. Um, separately from that, I wanted to make just two points. One is on the target groups we are looking at, and uh, in this case, I think we want to look not only at the temporary conditions in which these groups uh, are placed, but also at the long-term implications. What does it mean to be um, a forced migrant or a displaced person in a country, and what does that mean for the rest of your life, right? So if you take this concept of vulnerability on the long term, we also observe that uh, beyond language difficulties and literacy rates, they are facing poverty, a very difficult adaptation to other cultural norms, and uh, just the transition making it very difficult for them to, um, to move on with their lives, discrimination, educational inequalities, and even social exclusion. So if we look, think long term, I think we need to add another layer to this um, um, differentiation of services. So we start with emergency services, then we go on to basic services, but we also need to add some sort of empowerment services because long term, these people actually need much more than just um, uh, a temporary intervention. Um, so in this case, maybe we should also think of, of this um, empowerment uh, possibility. Thank you. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, Andri? Uh, Two minutes, not more. Thank you. Uh, there are also two points, uh, uh, <laughs> another two points, uh, not the same, were reached by Roxana. Uh, they are uh, the first major point is uh, the relation towards the convention. The, the, there is a major uh, document which adopted by the United Nations, as you know, in uh, 1951. And almost all states are the members of this convention. But the application of this convention is different uh, and differs from state to state. Uh, the practice, practice of uh, realization of the convention. The, the, the one of the best practices... Uh, one of the best practices uh, of developing uh, such kind of services of providing uh, real kind of rights for refugees, for migrants, uh, for, for, for refugees and IDPs, basically, are shown not by the states. They are shown by uh, intergovernmental organizations led by the United Nations and led by the United Nations Commission, uh, Higher Commissioner on Refugees. Under their uh, auspices, all, all services uh, were developed, uh, services related uh, also as for um, fulfilling their basic needs, uh, kind of food and water and other, uh, 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 improving li living conditions, but other, also uh, those services are related for education, for uh, uh, cultural, uh, 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 for fulfilling cultural needs. Well, I, I could uh, remember that the convention uh, provides uh, a kind of wide specter of uh, the uh, human rights, which should be guaranteed by uh, for for refugees, they, sh they should be uh, uh, not not only basic rights. They they should uh, be a uh, right for the normal conditions. They, even for, even development of uh, of, of rights, uh, the 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 intellectual properties and uh, this kind of. Uh, of rights, but the best practice are shown not by states, by uh, but uh, for, uh, but, but by uh, intergovernmental. One minute more, maybe just one minute. Uh, other question is relations between states. Oh, uh, relations between between states. They are sometimes not so good to develop joint services. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. And we have question from the floor. Two questions.
I, I, I think the, the, the examples you all give are great. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any examples of governments misusing this information, you know, intercepting... Louder. Oh, sorry. Uh, so I've, I think the examples are great, but I was wondering if you have any concrete examples of governments misusing this information to maybe stop uh, immigration flows or to uh, you know, uh, block financial uh, transactions from the diaspora back to immigration camps or refugee camps. Um, because if, you know, if, if it's all open data, it could be misused. Um, if I may, actually. Uh, can, can we ask no, it's linked to him, actually. It's actually linked to the same question. Okay. I was going to okay. ask something in the same vein. Because, honestly, I did the title of today's topic, and I thought, okay, great. This is probably speaking about migration, about immigration, about xenophobia, about internally displaced persons. And I'll be honest and say that I'm quite... Um, surprised that it doesn't touch on as much as what I expected that it would. But perhaps if I could pose to the panel a situation, because I come from Africa, I'm from South Africa, and the phenomenon that happened a few years ago, I think it was 2008, in South Africa, where we had the largest number of internally displaced persons who were migrants. It is unprecedented in the history of UN, Office of the High, um, UN, uh, uh, refugees, what's it? I was at OHCHR, UNHCR, UNHCR, sorry, the acronyms get to me. Um, but yeah, just to actually put to the, pan the panel that it, sometimes many of the persons, the IDPs, the refugees, they don't want their personal information shared. Governments can abuse their personal information and they're reluctant to share data or personal information, often when they come into our country, and given the South African dynamic, we already have internal race relations and politics, and now you have another group of persons coming in from the continent. We had black-on-black -black violence um, because they were immigrant communities of the same skin color as our locals. And working at the Human Rights Commission, people would come to us. I mean, we had thousands on one night. We worked for two hours straight, and... Um, two days straight until, like, what, four o'clock in the morning, just to get these people's names on a register because they didn't trust any other agencies besides UN and besides Human Rights Commission. So I want to put to the panel, if that was happening today, what technologies are out there, what could be done to have averted something um, or greater violence or, or just a mechanism in place to sort of address that sort of issue and gaining trust with the persons at the same time. Thanks. Okay, I think uh, we uh, must answer to the third question and to the fourth question, uh, our fourth question, uh, about technologies and uh, also about... Uh, uh, yes, yes. Uh, who will answer to those questions? Okay, I'll be short. Uh, I want to just, uh, it's not an answer actually, it's uh, because you asked for the, inter concerning, well, you raised the question concerning the interception and the misuse of the open data, practically. Uh, and I wanted before to bring this uh, example to the table. I recently had an occasion to develop and to work on the development of the cybercrime interception of communication um, legislation in Haiti. So, practically in Haiti, after the, um, they, they gave me the example, after the, um, the crisis, the disaster they had, uh, they developed online services for emergency, uh, for, um, for get access to the information. But the point is, Haiti, they don't have any legislation for the moment in the information society. So they don't have the legislation on the information society, any framework, well, including the cybercrime and interception of communications, which now is um, more or less ready. So my um, answer would be, I will not bring you the example, but... <laughs> Uh, maybe bilaterally I, I could give you a, a number of them. But I would say, you know, when we will speak about, when we speak about the solutions, we need also not to forget the legal part and the need for the legal framework. Because if we see today, we don't have really a framework uh, which underlines um, marginalized communities or, or links marginalized communities or vulnerable communities and ICTs, so information society. No. Thank you. Uh, Roxana, maybe you? Some words. Um, I wouldn't be um, able to answer what technologies are right now available, but maybe we can pass the microphone on. But um, I guess in terms of uh, data protection, 
I'm sure there is uh, much more to be done in this sphere. And um, the problem with emergency services is that everything happens so fast, and the collection of information is also very fast. Now, whether there is a management, of, a system of, to manage that information in place or not, I guess that depends on the local capacity and could be probably handled relatively easy with um, some sort of inscription. I would, I would throw that back at you and maybe you can give us more um, answers regarding what can be done technologically. Well, I mean, there are a lot of technologies available in, in the market and, and, and technology is evolving. When I look into, you know, how technology, what, what sort of technologies are available today that can be used in, in, in cases of emergency. Uh, we're thinking about cloud computing, which, which obviously have, you know, huge power in terms of being able to, to do large scale things um, in a very fast, you know, uh, time and, and a in a more secure way. So that's, that's, that's one thing that that's obviously is, is, is a powerful set of technologies available in the market. The other thing is, um, and, and uh, you know, uh, other, other technologies that, that needs to be used to some extent are, you know, how do we use social networks uh, and social networking technologies to support, uh, the, you know, you know the, uh, those crises is very powerful. Uh, technologies such as, uh, you know, voice and voice over IP. That can be another set of technologies because that's, you know, this is encrypted. It's, it's, uh, and it's, and obviously it's, uh, um, uh, it's, it's based on the internet. It's fast. You can use any kind of devices, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so technology is, and I just give a few examples about, you know, how technology, specific technologies can, can, can be used to address the problem. The reality is, um, I think uh, th there are two elements. One is uh, countries today, they have, they have to be prepared. They have to be prepared and they have to put in place, um, you know, frameworks, legal frameworks and policies. They have to put in place um, uh, technology infrastructure and, and even uh, processes and prepare their own people to the issues of, you know, emergency response, disaster management, those kind of things. Uh, because we, we, we will, it might happen. We don't know how it might happen, but it might happen internally, externally, etc. So we need to be prepared. We shouldn't wait until the, the disaster comes, and then we, we address the problem differently. So that's number one. And number two, I think technology is going to keep evolving and providing um, uh, opportunities for new scenarios, for new solutions, for new things to do. So we should not prevent ourselves from using the latest, uh, you know, the latest technologies in order to go fast. Interestingly, I mean, when, you, when, I, when I see what's happened in, um, in, um, uh, in, in the last two years and how, how the industry have been able to react very fast by using the latest technologies like new mapping tools, you know, big data, uh, cloud computing, etc. It has been, you know, very innovative, very uh, inspiring, uh, actually, to, to see how people get and to use the latest, etc. So I, I want, I want, I'm very optimistic. Uh, you can see it. I'm very optimistic about how, how you know, developers can come up with, you know, bright ideas and, and use the latest stuff. Hello, Lucia. Yeah, only um, one comment that um, is very aligned with what you said. That it's only, uh, I just want to highlight that we need to take, uh, to look at, we have all this innovation to create this kind of tools for, to support this, uh, uh, the, um, the people who need uh, 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 help. But additionally, uh, we need a balance in the legislation between uh, the protection of the human rights, privacy, and everything, and the development uh, on, on the new technologies. So it's a, it's a, it's a challenge for the legislators, uh, for the regulators in our countries. 
And I think we need to follow general principles, for example, in the privacy on data protection. I think that uh, we, we, need, we don't need to create regulation for every tool that is developed to uh, use in that technology. We have general principles, uh, protection of human rights, our constitutions uh, in our countries. So the most important thing is that uh, we need to create this, this balance and don't stop this innovation uh, and protect human rights on the other, uh, and the gen in general principles. Thank you, Anil Lucia. Yeah. Yurio, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I promise to say a couple of words about the tsunami 2004, which was in, in not very far from here. And of course, when uh, 178 Finns died in that tsunami, they were holidaying in Thailand at that time. And of course, I'm ashamed of talking about that because I know that Indonesia lost so many, you know, tens of thousands of people. But anyway, as an example, uh, uh, the bad news was that uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where I was working at the time, we had a brand new uh, software for precisely this purpose, for you know, getting information, registering people who were missing, and, and, and so on and so forth. The, the, the bad news, however, was that nobody had been trained to use it. And uh, that meant that that was unusable in, a, in a, that sort of situation, and people had to literally go back to had to go back to paper and pen. However, uh, the, uh, a good example was that we were able to improvise uh, something uh, in those, during those days. That is to say, the uh, fin air, the Finnish airline org organized evacuation flights, but we had to relay this information to the Finns who were in Thailand. We, there were about uh, 6,000 Finns, uh, and about 3,000 were in the disaster area. Uh, the, uh, we were able to get everybody together, the operators, the authorities, agencies, and so on and so forth. We decided to send a text message, an SMS, to all phones in Thailand that were connected to Finnish operators, S uh, the Sonera and Elisa and so on and so forth. And, uh, uh, and they, they, those text messages told uh, the Finns there, all who had uh, mobile phones, and of course all of them had, uh, that uh, to go to specific places where they could be evacuated. And that was quite successful. One more thing about uh, tsunami. They were, as I said, everybody, all those people had mobile phones. They were certainly, if there was any, any, continu any connectivity, they were informing their friends and relatives immediately in Finland. So a, 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 a tremendous flow of information went, came back, back to Finland immediately on Sunday. And so there were people in Finland uh, separately who knew all about this. However, at the Ministry of Foreign, uh, Foreign Affairs, we were not part of that information flow and we didn't know anything. For, for a full day, we thought that not one thin had perished. Turned out it was 174. So uh, applications that could somehow, perhaps using social media, that would make that sort of information available, pool it and aggregate it, uh, would be, uh, would be uh, I, I think, very useful for disaster situations. Thank you. Thank you, Yurio. And uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you, the lady from Africa. Re really challenging question, and as well as uh, from the audience, the the case about it that uh, the really good precedent for the the Rwanda genocide in 1994 in April, what happened in Chigali between Hutus and Tutsis. At that time, the government was able to disguise the information for a while, and of course, there were some other issues regarding the, what happened that time in a UN uh, Security Council. But the case is, in nowadays, it's when there's a, uh, the extent of the level of the ICT development and the access of the civilians, as well as the tourists and the journalists to the, the, the most contemporary ICT gadgets, it's a bit difficult as a state to uh, discard and uh, mislead information, and the good examples are today are Syria 
and what happening there, and then we can see completely different pictures in one hand and then on the other hand. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, have we uh, some questions from remote participants? A lot of questions. Yes? yes? Probably one question, and after that I will summarize. I'm sorry we are like 10 minutes late. Is it okay for the panelists, like five more minutes? Is it okay? <laughs> so probably question from, you know, from the remote participants. Let me, let me it's important uh, to speak with remote participants. Okay. Uh, so, uh, question from Travis uh, at uh, Eber, uh, Uh Following the earthquake in Haiti, crime and violence increased dramatically, especially against vulnerable groups. My question is, would the panel comment on the use of internet technologies like the one created in Columbia University to provide better security for both domestic and displaced populations through these technologies. Mikhail, I think you must answer this question uh, about our team. Yeah, um, okay. And uh, make yeah. some conclusions. Pro probably, yeah, if, if, if you don't mind. Yeah, so uh, the thing is here in terms of internet technologies uh, for reducing crime and violence after the earthquake. So I think... Um, uh, the most important part is that if you're talking about internet technologies helping you know, to, to uh, let's say, to decrease level or to prevent increasing level of crime or violence, services should be established before any disasters. That's what we actually mentioned, you know, in terms of uh, providing services uh, before the disaster. So in order to help, uh, in order to help, um, uh, that's why uh, if, uh, you know, if there are any services uh, like uh, positioning services or services for uh, like RFID technologies for, for some personal belongings uh, or probably uh, some, uh, let's say, surveillance services uh, around uh, and with established infrastructure that was uh, noticed, you know, at the beginning, then I think, yeah, it would help. It would definitely help to prevent, you know, increasing of, of the crime and, and the violence, even after disaster, yeah, you know, even before disaster, right? Uh, so in terms of conclusions and, and summarizing the workshop, it's uh, very nice. It's, it's really nice that uh, all the panelists made, uh, you know, made it <laughs> finally, because uh, we, we have such a, you know, big, great panel and, and quite fruitful discussion here. And uh, uh, I would like to thank you. And uh, in terms of uh, summarizing and conclusions, so I would like to put uh, some, you know, some, some several points. So first of all, yeah, if you're talking about services for displaced people or migrants, we should think about infrastructure and who is going to build it. Or actually, if it already exists, if you're talking about some particular countries that was um, mentioned at the beginning, then uh, some basic services from technological side, technological perspective should be introduced, uh, some communication technologies, right? Uh, then uh, services which we are talking about, they should be relevant. Uh, relevant, they, they should be related to, to migrants, they should be massive. And uh, they should be provided on relevant language, which is also quite important. And actually, there should be a legal database uh, to implement these services. Because, uh, you know, legal aspects, they depend on, on, on particular countries. Uh, another thing is that uh, in terms of some basic services, it's quite important to, uh, as also some panelists uh, admitted, uh, it's quite important to uh, to develop services under some legal aspects in terms of family tracing. Even if the service is quite helpful, anyway, uh, there should be some legal aspects for that. Uh, services, there should be special services for protection, displaced people and migrants, information society, so uh, how they should interact, how they should work online, uh, and there should be work done with, with local authorities. In terms of um, uh, payable me mechanisms, so uh, how they should be spread, the services. So it should be studied case by case, but some basic services like, you know, education, it should be free, some health care should be free, and uh, probably some basic services according to the convention, right? Uh, 
As it was uh, noticed, there should be strategy uh, with legal background to support displaced people and refugees and migrants through online services or internet of services, uh, which should be discussed and formed, right? And uh, services, uh, development of the services should be based on open data and open platform concept and approach, uh, which is uh, necessary uh, and which is necessity in terms of uh, providing them also globally. Uh, and um, as it was, yeah, again, just to emphasize that, uh, that empowerment services, they should be related to the convention uh, in terms of uh, applications uh, for, for some particular, you know, countries. Uh, and, um, yeah, and if you're talking about uh, some basic, also basic rules, uh, there should be a, a basic privacy, so just ordinary general uh, data protection uh, rule for all the services uh, independent, uh, you know, uh, without uh, developing some, some special cases for, for, for the particular service. Um, and in terms of, um, so I do hope that actually we will be able to, to continue a discussion on, on, on these issues mentioned here uh, as a multi-stakeholder approach uh, you know, which is actually, you know, in a multi-stakeholder approach, which is necessary uh, in order to be able to implement, you know, what we are talking about here. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mikhail. And uh, I want to, to thank all the participants. I think uh, that uh, time was very short for discussion of uh, this very important and uh, I think um, multi-aspect problem, a problem uh, that uh, is connected with um, different aspects of uh, living, of policy, of law, of technologies. And uh, I think uh, that um, uh, we have good prospects to discuss uh, more about these problems and uh, about uh, uh, these uh, prospects, uh, maybe next year, we have good plans, good prospects, and um, I think uh, it will be great uh, uh, to make new meeting in new place and discuss uh, all those problems. Thank you very much. Thank you for your participation. Thank you.